There are a few names synonymous with the world of tiki, and today I'm going to take a look at one of those luminaries and three of the cocktails that he made famous. I'm talking specifically about Don the Beachcomber, otherwise known as Don Beach. Don Beach, Beachy Don, Donny Beach, Beach, Beachy, Beachy, Beachy. Back to the beach. <laughs> The first thing to know about Don, and really guys like Don, is that, you know, he was prone to telling tall tales about himself. He was prone to embellishing his legend where he could. He was, in short, a bullshit artist. So it's difficult to separate fact from fiction with this guy, okay? We can't really take his own word for it, and I kind of become particularly skeptical when things just sort of fit and line up a bit too neatly. That said, we do know that Don the Beachcomber, or Don Beach, was actually born Ernest Raymond Beaumont Gant in Texas in or around 1907. According to Don, he spent his early years bouncing between Texas, Louisiana, and Jamaica. Texas and Louisiana at least makes sense to me because his mother is from Texas, his father was from Louisiana, but I've got no corroborating evidence for the Jamaica bit, so I am kind of tempted to chalk that one up to colorful embellishment on his part, but maybe not. Who can tell? I mean, there's definitely parts things from my life that people don't believe. I think that they think it's just sort of bullshit, but you know, that's, that happened to me. That's true. Um, anyway, suffice to say that by the time he was 16 years old, he was working with his mother in Texas running a rooming house. And four years later, he left home. And um, I take him his word there because there's really nothing fantastical about any of that, at least. Though, according to the interview he gave in 1987, he spent the next four years traveling around the world. I mean, maybe? It's not completely outside the realm of possibility, but it does very neatly fit with the uh, image he wanted to project for himself, right? I'd be willing to bet that that's an extreme embellishment of I tramped around and worked odd jobs. Uh, whatever the case, in 1929, it seems he was employed as a supercargo. That's a representative of the ship's owner who was responsible for the sale of the cargo in port on a boat bound for Australia by way of Hawaii, which my research suggests is at least sort of corroborated. He then spent another year working cargo ships in the South Pacific. And I should pause here to explain that cargo ships are a fundamentally different concept from modern container ships. They function differently. And if he was a supercargo, it's very possible like that they were like tramp cargo ships, where it was literally like, what's for sale? Like, like you might actually experience in a piracy video game <laughs> where you pull into a port. It's like, what's for sale here? We will buy that. Hopefully we can sell that in the next port for more money than we paid for it here. And that would be like the supercargo's job to kind of facilitate those kinds of like, like trader, you know, things. At least that's my understanding on it. This is a very different world from now. And it's kind of difficult to like, be, wait, wait, is that real? Or is that like some kind of like fantastical pulp fiction adventure story nonsense? But it does seem to be that's how it was. I mean, a cargo ship is a open hulled cargo ship. You have stevedores who have to, why am I talking about cargo ships? Point is, it's not a container ship. They worked a little bit differently. That's all I'm saying. Okay, um, he spent another year working cargo ships in the South Pacific, maybe. Um, some of his contemporaries say the idea that he actually lived in the South Pacific is lies. Some don't. It's kind of impossible to pull apart. He also claims that he was involved in bootlegging during Prohibition. And again, maybe. Uh, that's definitely not outside the realm of possibility. Um, but all of this is kind of beachcomber prehistory. So I kind of think of it sort of as Don Beach mythology. You know, it's, yeah, B.C. or B.C.E. now. And I, this would be a, be a B. D B E before Don Beach era. That's I gotta stick to the script. This is just bad. But now let me move into the realm of the concrete, verifiable facts. In 1933, Don opened up Don's Beachcomber at 1722 North McCadden Place in Hollywood. He started going by the name Don the Beachcomber just as a result of the bar's success. He eventually legally changed his name to Don Beach. Actually, according to an LA city official, it was to distance himself from his earlier bootlegging days and specifically from a speakeasy he ran, which was called Ernie's Place, which at least lends some credence to the idea that he was involved in bootlegging. I would buy that he ran a speak. Don is sometimes credited with effectively inventing tiki as an American bar phenomenon, um, and that might hold some water. I am, of course, speaking about tiki, the American bar phenomenon, the kitsch, ersatz, um, California uh, fad and not the actual Polynesian cultures, right? Of course, those are separate entities. But I do think that Don Beach was instrumental in at least, I mean, there's no question that he was instrumental in popularizing tiki in America. Um, did he invent tiki? 
Maybe. Imitators opened bars with similar names all around the country. There's actually a whole chain of beachcomber bars on the East Coast that he had nothing to do with. Um, the Beachcomber was an extremely popular spot in Hollywood and it was frequented by all kinds of Hollywood stars and luminaries. Um, he met and married his first wife in the 30s, uh, Cora Irene Sund, uh, who everyone apparently called Sunny. She was instrumental in the Beachcomber expansion and opened new locations around the country. From 1942 to 1945, Don was actually in the Army Air Corps. Uh, he was wounded during a U-boat attack on a ship that he was aboard and continued the rest of his stint in the Army operating rest and relaxation centers on posts in the South Pacific. So he, whether he did before or not, he finally did manage to get there and, and sling some drinks, I guess. <laughs> when the war was over, Don and Sonny divorced. Hey guys, I don't normally do this, but uh, I have new information, or at least it's new information to me. When I shot this, when I put this episode together, when I did my research, I thought I knew everything I could know about this. Um, but I have since found out that uh, Don and Cora Irene actually divorced in 1940 before he joined the army. Um, or before he was inducted into the army. I think he, I think he was inducted. I think he was commissioned in as a captain, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they divorced in 1940 and continued to work together amicably uh, until he went into the military, um, did his service. And I think there's some actual question here about him ever actually doing any active duty. I think he actually went in to run uh, rest and relaxation setups. I think that was actually the whole plan. Again, uh, the submarine injury or whatever it was may be embellishment on his part. But when he got out, um, for whatever reason, and I don't know, he willingly signed over operation of the stateside business to Cora. I think he continued to get like checks, royalty checks, percentages or whatever said here, take the business. I'm done. I want to get the hell out of here. And he went to Hawaii and did his own thing with the international marketplace. There was, as far as I can tell, she didn't win um, the property in a divorce settlement. He was not barred from you know, using his own name or from opening a beachcomber. In fact, he ran one in Hawaii. Um, it was just sort of the agreement that they, whatever agreement that they came to of their own accord uh, to split up the business and decide for him to essentially, I think, kind of do a kind of working retirement more or less um, seems to be the case. So yeah, I just wanted to make sure I got that right. And now back to the show. Um, I don't know what was really going on there and how that kind of arrangement happened. My research strongly suggests that despite his being kind of a mascot and impresario, the actual business, its expansion, its success, it was all down to Sund, not Don. She's the one who expanded the restaurant to a 16 location chain while he was in the army. And that is without pulling apart whatever else I don't know about their marriage and why they need to split, okay? We're gonna leave it alone. It's in the past. It's their business. I, I you know, ugh. He moved to the then territory of Hawaii and opened the international marketplace which is a famous um, historic location until it was demolished in 2008 to build the Saks of Fifth Avenue. The Saks of Fifth Avenue. The Saks of Fifth Avenue. If you're familiar with uh, the Buena Vista Shopping Village, no, um, Downtown Disney, no, um, International Showcase, no, 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 that's not it. Uh, Disney Springs, that's the ticket. Uh, you get the idea. Um, the International Marketplace was, I, I think, kind of the model for that, actually. Um, the mall. No, not really. I mean, it's like, you know, different. Anyway, um, let's make some drinks right after this message from this episode's sponsor. Do you sleep? Sure, we all do. I like to do my sleeping on a daily basis, generally at night, and I've been practicing at it my whole life. And I like to think I'm getting pretty good at it, which might be why Helix Sleep thought we'd be such great partners and sponsored this episode. So thank you, Helix Sleep. Now you're asking, Greg, what's Helix Sleep? And I'm glad you asked. Helix is a premium mattress in a box company that makes mattresses to fit your unique needs and preferences based on your body and sleep style. Maybe you're an old school back sleeper or a wicked gnarly side sleeper or a bee flopping belly sleeper. I've been working on my own brand of freestyle snoozing where I start out on my back, but actually probably my side. Then I do some weird flips and turns in the night and wake up tangled and confused. It's totally radical. I took the Helix sleep quiz and they paired me up with a midnight Lux based on my results. So far, I feel like this uh, has really helped me step up my sleep game, grooving in on some deep REMs. That's the kind of foundation that just sets up your whole day to be better. I'm real into this uh, medium firm setup for my backside sleep grind that I'm on. My wife seems to like it too. The quiz for couples takes questions from both of you. One thing I love about Helix is the mattress comes with a 10 year warranty, which is totally awesome. And 
you get a 100 night sleep trial because they get it. It's kind of scary buying a mattress over the internet that you have not touched or seen in a showroom. No one's given you a high pressure sales pitch, but no big deal because you've got a full three months to test it out risk-free in your own home. And if you don't absolutely love it, they're gonna come back, pick it up, give you a full refund. Sweet. Okay, for this next part, let me ask you something. Do you love free shipping? Of course you do, we all do. Well, here's the thing. Helix will deliver your mattress for free to your front door anywhere within the US. You just haul that sucker in, pop it open, let it do its thing, and you're in slumber town, baby. I'm betting there's a good chance you have a neck, and if that's the case, you probably love using pillows when you sleep. As such, the good people at Helix have a special offer for HED fans. If you click the link below to pick up a mattress, you're gonna get 200 bucks off your Helix sleep mattress, plus a free pair of pillows. And let me tell you, these are serious pillows. All right. I'm going to take a nap and hand the reins on this episode back over to Awake Greg now. Uh, good night. Okay, so uh, drink number one. Let's start with the first drink. Uh, it's called the QB Cooler. QB Cooler. The QB Cooler has nothing to do with football. It was actually named for the Quiet Birds, also known as the Ancient Order of the Quiet Birds, which was a sort of secret society for World War I aviators. This drink was first created in the 30s at Don's Beachcomber. Um, the recipe that I'm going to make today is from 1937, though the drink may have been invented before then. Don evolved and modified it a bit over the years, um, this way, that way. It's mostly famous because allegedly Trader Vic was trying to emulate this drink when he came up with the Mai Tai. Uh, the two actually fought over the name Mai Tai for a bit uh, so that they could each sell and bottle a Mai Tai mix that I, I'm not even sure ever materialized, never went to market. Um, Regardless, Vic won that bout and is officially credited as the inventor of the Mai Tai. And I, I think that's honestly fair because the QB cooler is not a Mai Tai. Although I will be making it in this Mai Tai glass. Um, I'm going to start with my shaker. Okay, and into this we're going to put an ounce of fresh orange juice, which I squeezed before this episode because you know, that's a lot of work. Ounce of fresh orange juice, here we go. I do really enjoy some fresh orange juice. I'm gonna drink that over a way. Whatever we don't use here, we're gonna drink. Half an ounce of lime juice. Whoa, that like slipped in a very dangerous way. It's a very thick rinded or lime, so I have a funny feeling we're not gonna get a ton of juice. Like we're gonna get eh, a little more than I was worried we might get. Sometimes when you get those really thick ones, they can be um, pretty dry. So half an ounce of this. And already there's orange juice in it, right? So this is nothing really like a Mai Tai. Exactly a half an ounce came out of this guy. Half an ounce of honey mix. I usually, um, oh, I haven't put that in yet. Half an ounce of lime juice, there we go. Half an ounce of honey mix. Now, I usually make this uh, two parts honey to one part water, but um, my research suggests that Don was doing it in one to one. So I made this batch one to one, and this is just one part honey, one part water. It makes it um, easier to pour. How could this ever be confused with a Mai Tai? quarter ounce of ginger syrup. A quarter ounce of velvet falernum. By the way, if you're having trouble finding this at your local liquor store or any of the spirits I use on this episode, please check the link below uh, for the Curiata shop set up just for this episode. Help you find all these bottles and have them shipped straight to your home. Um, hopefully if you are in one of the areas that we can service, if not, I apologize, but you know, um, there's not much I can do about it. <laughs> it's better than nothing. Half an ounce of El Dorado, um, five or eight year round I'm using the five today. I think the eight would be a little better, but I don't seem to have a bottle of the eight year. So a half an ounce of El Dorado five year rum, one ounce of Bacardi Blanco, a lot of rum in this and one ounce of Appleton Estate Signature. Um, I would stand by a, a, um, a Smith & Cross here too. I do have this lovely Appleton Estate and there's already so much rum in this that I don't think we need the extra proof. The tricky cork, guys, there we go. Don't always love an artificial, uh, synthetic cork. Yeah, I don't always love that. And two dashes of Angostura bitters. Two dashes, Angostura. Okay, shake, we're gonna shake this up with some crushed ice or really well cracked ice, and then we're gonna open pour it into our Mai Tai glass. I'm using a different spoon today, a suitably tiki one with a little skull, like a, one of those sugar skulls from 
Dia de los Muertos. That drink got so cold it actually hurt my hand. That doesn't happen that often. And then we're going to garnish that with a fresh mint sprig. Give it a little clippity clap. There we go. Not too bad looking. Should have a shorter straw, but I got a long one, so here we go. This is the QB cooler. Let's see how it is. Ooh, that's lovely. I can see why it gets compared to a Mai Tai, which is weird because that ingredient list does not really resemble a Mai Tai. The honey, which there isn't really that much in there compared to the other ingredients, you really get that honey pretty much right up front. I mean, the honey and orange really kind of lead this drink with a little bit of lime, like that tart, it turns like bitter, but no, not unpleasant, not like bitters wrong. Lime has a limey bitterness that is lime. Lime juice is more bitter than orange juice or whatever. So it has that lime bitterness, which I love. It's not like a, um, a earth bitter or root bitter. It's not like a gentian or anything like that. Um, this is very, this is surprisingly tart, very refreshing drink really just the right amount of sweetness to balance it. It's a really, it's a drink intention. It's a very well balanced drink. Um, the r combination of rums, to be perfectly honest, I don't know that I have a palate sophisticated enough to pull that all apart and tease it all apart, but I would say that the sum of these parts is delicious. Can I, experience each individual note of those rums I put in there on their own? No, I can't. I don't have that ability. Um, I can say that this is a very good drink that I will finish. Mm, I do love a mint garnish. Anyway, that is the QB Cooler, um, a really old school uh, Don Beach drink from Don's Beachcomber. Uh, this is the 1937 recipe. Let's talk about the Cobra Fang. This is another Don Beach original, Don Beach classic. This drink was invented invented in 1937, or at the very least, it first appears on the 1937 menu at Don's Beachcomber, and it's a real mainstay of the Tiki Pantheon. It has led to a bunch of variations and adaptations off of it, notably the Sidewinder's Fang, which was created at the Lanai, um, and also the one that I did for Cobra Kai. Nice. So it's possible that the Sidewinder's Fang has actually had more staying power, despite being the derivative version um, I think that the Sidewinder is usually presented with this really neat snake that you make from an orange peel. I was actually considering presenting the Cobra's Fang in the same way, but actually in the original Don Beach style, it's garnished with a cinnamon stick. Also, if you look this drink up online, you will find a lot of recipes that call for passion fruit juice. That is a fine way to go. And it's actually the way I was gonna do this version originally myself. Um, but as far as I've read, Don's original version actually calls for fashion ola syrup. Fashionola has a lot of passion fruit in it, but it's also got hibiscus and strawberries and other stuff. It's the secret ingredient in the original Hurricane, too. Um, you can make your own, which I did in my Hurricane episode, which is linked below. The old school de facto brand is this stuff called Johnny English. Last I checked, you kind of actually have to order that on eBay. But then I realized it's Cocktail and Sons season. Cocktail and Sons produces this um, beloved and coveted craft Fashionola syrup in limited batches, uh, I think actually just once a year. And so since the stars aligned and I, I finally I was like, oh yeah, I have a reason to order it. And hey, it's available right now. I ordered um, a bunch of fashion oil syrup to have. So I'm gonna actually use theirs. Um, if you can't get your hands on this, um, and hopefully you will be able to, but if you can't, um, I would recommend doing um, either your own um, fashion oil syrup, which I will provide a link to my video where I made some for my, um, for the hurricane that I did, uh, which is pretty close. It's a little bit different, but pretty close enough, or uh, just doing a passion fruit substitution, okay? So what I'm going to do is put some crushed or really heavily cracked ice into this. I'm gonna start with a half an ounce of fresh orange juice. I need a half an ounce of lime juice. Half an ounce of falernum again. And that does provide sweetness, right? So that's almost a syrup, but not quite. Um, a quarter ounce of fashionola syrup. You will find that a lot of these ingredients, um, recipes call for a dash of grenadine. That is mainly, I think, just to get that red color back in there. 
because um, these won't have it otherwise. One dash of absinthe. I'm actually using Le Fiverte. One dash of Angostura bitters. Um, I need a half an ounce of an overproof Demerara. There's, I think, pretty much only one game in town for that, which is Lemon Heart 151. So half an ounce of this stuff. Yes. He's nice. And I need a half an ounce of, quote, dark Jamaican rum. Um, you know, I was going to use the Meyer here, which, I mean, admittedly comes in a handle, and I like Meyer's rum. This is not coveted rum, but I think this is the right choice. <laughs> Has it accidentally developed a perfect three-color stripe there? Not really what we were going for, but that's fun. Now I need to swizzle this just a little bit, and I really should have my ice should be a little, a little smaller to do this. There we go. We're gonna add some more ice to that to top it up. And yes, I should have a loose bag and be crushing ice, but I am a little bit lazy. I really like the way that looks, actually. Traditionally, this will be garnished with a lime wheel and a cinnamon stick. I think that's perfect. Ooh, that's delicious. That's good. What is that? That is the cinnamon, which we didn't add any cinnamon ingredients to this, but is it coming off the stick? Yeah, you're getting some of that on your nose. I mean, cinnamon stick's a powerful thing, but the whole drink has a, a cinnamoniness to it. And I don't know if that's some kind of magic from just having the garnish there or the alchemy of what's in the glass. That lime orange falernum base really do kind of form a, sort of a magic little foundation in these cocktails, right? Like you can kind of just like put things on them and it tends to work really well. It's sweet with some Caribbean style spices thrown in there. And by spices, I mean, or maybe I should say Polynesian style spices because I don't mean, it's not spicy. It's like cinnamon, vanilla, you know, very pleasant, even Christmassy even spices. It's balanced. It's, I mean, this is just very mildly sweetened just right, just right, right on the edge, I would say, of being not sweet enough. In fact, I would say you could probably double the Fashionola and this would still be um, a really good drink. I won't because it doesn't need it, but I'm thinking that, you know, if you had like a sweeter drink, yeah, you can increase that and you will love it. The rum selections here, the Lemon Heart 151, this is a tough rum to beat, this is wonderful stuff, that you really taste burnt sugar. I mean, the whole thing just kind of tastes like this burnt, sugar, the little bit of funk from the Myers really complements that. It gets this very molasses-y vibe to it. This is, and both of these too, really, right? Like these both represent to me really the best kind of drinks of tiki. They're balanced. They're not spirit forward, but they are spirity. Like they're not like a, a Manhattan, it's spirit forward. But like these drinks are not hiding their alcohol, their booze, right? Like it's just not like the alcohol buried in syrups or something like that. These taste like rum um, and good rum, and they present that rum in a very flattering light. I like this drink a lot, and I really like the cinnamon garnish. I think the cinnamon garnish is kind of key here because I'm, now I'm sure it is the garnish that you're getting into the flavor from the smell and from it seeping into the drink. There is a real legit kick of cinnamon here coming from that garnish, and I almost didn't include that because a lot of other recipes for this don't include that and I get my wires crossed on my research, but then I remember the original calls for cinnamon and I think the cinnamon is vital. I think you cannot skip the cinnamon in this drink. And it's cool because it's not a cinnamon syrup. Like it doesn't, it doesn't need to be a cinnamon syrup to work. Ooh, man, I really like that Cobra Fang. Phenomenal, another great one. All right, for the third and final drink of this episode, we're looking at the Missionary's Downfall. This drink was invented by Don Beach in 1948. So it's a little bit of a later one. And it's one of the ones that calls for and requires a blender. At least Don's original process for it seems to call for a blender. I've seen modern takes on it that go for a muddler, but since I've actually never gotten around to making this one before now, let's give it a whirl in the original way, okay? We're gonna start by taking our blender and we're going to add to it some ice, okay? Three, about three quarters of a cup of crushed ice. And really, I would say that that cube is probably about three quarters of a cup of ice, right? So when it crushes up, when the blades have their, their way with it, that will be three quarters of a cup. So a big cube. We wanna add um, half an ounce of fresh lime juice. As it happens, I have the lime kind of already kind of opened up right here. So let's see if we got a half an ounce there. I suspect that we will. 
Some of that went to the uh, cut on my thumb. That's always a pleasant feeling. Um, half an ounce of the honey syrup again, one to one. A quarter cup or so of pineapple chunks. So it's not too much really. That's like probably that much. 10 to 12 mint leaves, 11. Okay, 12 mint leaves. Half an ounce of peach brandy. I go with cheapo stuff here, the, <laughs> the Kuiper peach tree. Tastes very strongly of peaches. And I think that's the intent. Half an ounce of that. Um, would this drink originally have called for an eau de vie? My thinking is no. I think that he means peach flavored stuff. And I need an ounce of a, uh, a Puerto Rican rum. Um, Ron Baralito would be great here. I have Bacardi, um, just by coincidence. One ounce of Bacardi Gold. All right, put this onto your blender. And pour that into a coupe, believe it or not. What an interesting thing. A mint green slushy. I am fascinated. And uh, tradition dictates that we garnish this with a mint sprig. And there you have a missionary's downfall. Let's see how this drink is. That is beautiful, really. Woo! Wow, that's good. <laughs> it's like nothing I've ever had. I've never had one of these. This is really cool. That balance of flavors of the pineapple, the peach, and the mint really work well together. The whole effect is one of just like whoo, bright, light freshness. This is a really nice drink. And now granted this blender has a lot of oomph to it, right? I think there's something to this with uh, just about the right amount of ice and the pineapple. Pineapple, of course, I don't actually know the technical reason why, but pineapple, you know, froths. It has some kind of a um, foaming, binding kind of action to it. And the texture of the mint, it almost makes it like a very soft, light ice cream. It has structure. This isn't just a slushy. Like this thing, uh, you can eat this with a spoon. Mm. And yet you can easily drink it. It is really good. And no wonder he called it Missionary's Downfall because you can't taste <laughs> the alcohol. It just tastes like a very light, fresh, minty <laughs> breath of fresh air. It is delicious. Oh man. And the texture is really extremely unique and tough to be, impossible to beat. You can't beat that texture. That's really cool. It does stick to your mustache, which is a little bit gross, but the actual, you know, it is, this reminds me of like fresh cut grass from my bicycle when we were riding to find the ice cream truck in two neighborhoods over. And we were like, it's around here somewhere. Those summer afternoons of just like 20 of us kids riding our bikes. That's what that reminds me of. Man, that's crazy. This is one of the coolest damn cocktails I've ever had. You gotta make this drink, it's really cool. I would not use a fancier um, eau de vie, like a real peach schnapps or peach brandy made from peaches, right? This is a peach schnapps flavored like peaches and it is very peach flavored. An eau de vie will have a peachiness to it, but they generally don't taste really peachy. As a matter of fact, I do have a really good one right here. I do wonder how it would have been with this. Yeah, see, I mean, this has just on the nose. This smells like um, peach ring candies that you get at the gas station. This uh, smells more like brandy, to be perfectly honest, but you can get the, oh yes, but maybe there is a peach element to it. This will not have the volume, the loudness of peach flavor to stand up to the rest of this drink because this, which is extremely cartoonishly peachy, is almost lost in here. Um, so it needs to have that really cartoon peach flavor to not get completely drowned out in this drink. Um, and so I would go with that kind of stuff. I wouldn't go with the fancy stuff here. It does not taste like watermelon, but yet somehow it reminds me of watermelons. I'm sorry guys, I'm actually unusually at a loss for words here. I freaking love this drink. I've never had it before, it's blowing my mind. Uh, well, assuming the vaccine rollout is complete, and we're looking at a roaring 20s kind of summer this year. You bring these out at a summer party, it's going to be a hit. Those are really neat. Whew, man, that's cool. I made three drinks from Don the Beachcomber's repertoire today. Uh, the history of his bar and um, really the foundations of Tiki. 
uh, fascinating stuff. Sort of maybe the counterpoint to the Mai Tai, the QB Cooler. The Cobra Fang, which is a staple and uh, tiki, you know, foundational classic and frankly delicious. And um, the Missionary's Downfall, which is just from another planet. This thing is awesome. If you're having a hard time finding any of the spirits I use on this show and you live in the U.S., do yourself a favor um, and do me a favor too because we're working as a partnership. Uh, check out the link in the pinned comment below to Curiata, who will be stocking all of these bottles for you and shipping them to, I think, currently 28 U.S. states and hopefully the one that you're in. Um, that's a great deal. I mean, if that works out for you, if, if you have a hard time finding these bottles, I know rums in particular can be really hard to find, even at a good liquor store here in the tri-state area. Um, a lot of times your rum selection is limited to Bacardi and Captain Morgan and stuff that technically is not really rum. Check out Curiata. There's a link in the pin comment below. They're going to have a listing for all the spirits that I used in this episode. And also kind of, they have a, a how to drink collection too, which is just sort of the favorite spirits of mine that show up on the show again and again. I'm Greg. This is HTD. Today's show about the history of some, some his tiki history for you. I, I've I've had a little tiki history now, and I am uh, I might be losing the plot slightly. I think that's what's happening to me. I may have lost a bit of the plot a bit. Um, these are not to be taken lightly. These are some stronger stronger beverages. So check me out on Twitter at How to Drink, Instagram at How to Drink, Patreon at Patreon.com/slash How to Drink, where the parts of this episode that I couldn't include in this episode will be found. Uh, and on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Greg from HTD. Um, I will see you soon with another episode of How to Drink. Uh, hey, I've been doing this show for five years. I say this in every episode. Blah, 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 bl